All right, so uh, we're moving along in Faust then. Um, and here, um, Act 3 is known as the Helena, the Helena. It was the first thing uh, of Part 2 that Goethe wrote back in 1800 when his friend Schiller was still alive, who died in 1805. Um, so he'd been working on it. It's the earliest part, just as we have finished here with the classical Walpurgis Nacht, which was the last part that he wrote just uh, about two years before his death in 1832. He was working on it through the first six months of 1830. And I think it's the greatest thing he's ever written. But now with Act 3, I actually want to read the entire thing because I think it's quite rich and quite dense and quite complex. So now we have moved in our erotic transformations from the parthenogenetic birth of Seismos, which was the earth, Gaia, simply giving birth to a mountain, to uh, the conjunctio of homunculus shattering his alembic onto the vaginal clamshell uh, that Gal the nymph Galatea was riding on in place of Aphrodite. And so here we have Botticelli's birth of Venus, um, where she is represented, this, this is Venus proper, no longer Raphael's Galatea, uh, Venus proper coming in on the half shell, and she's moving out of the ocean where she has emerged from the genitals of uh, Kronos, her father, um, and then uh, um, off from sea to land. And so likewise, here we have Helen, as this scene opens up, who has also just been brought in from the ocean. We've been out on the Aegean Sea in the previous uh, act. And so now with Act 3, Helen, like Aphrodite, uh, both exemplars of classical beauty, is coming in off the water. She believes, mistakenly, this scene is full of ironies, she believes mistakenly that uh, Menelaus has brought her from the Trojan War back to Sparta. So we're back to the Peloponnesus, uh, to Sparta, the Mycenaean war fortress of Sparta, circa 1200 BC. And, but she's actually, of course, as we've seen, been brought up from the underworld where Faust was going to go down there, though Goethe didn't write the scene, to go down there and, and be like a new Orpheus who would sing with Manto uh, at his side to help him uh, sing, uh, not sing, but, but uh, tell Proserpina and move her to tears that, that he wants Helen. And so she has agreed to allow Helen to be released and, and to come up from the underworld. But Helen has a different impression she's forgotten her journey from the underworld as souls do actually as we do when we're born and we incarnate we don't have a memory of our previous lifetimes or our time on the other side so we come with a what appears to be a blank slate although of course it really isn't and um so she's forgotten and so here we start off with before the palace of menelaus at sparta enter helena and the chorus of captive trojan women so a group of Trojan women have been brought back with her, ostensibly by Menelaus, but really by Mephistopheles and Faust. Faust doesn't appear in this scene. Uh, and Penthalus is the leader of the chorus, the, the main singer. And then we have Helena in here. Uh, the prologos that she gives is, is derived directly from Euripides. Um, but before we get into the actual reading, I want to take a look at Jane Ellen Harrison's um, reading of the judgment of Paris, because she does make uh, reference to Paris having abducted her. And here we have Jane Ellen Harrison's excellent book, uh, The Prolegomena to uh, Greek Religion, uh, which came out just around the turn of the uh, 20th century, right around 1900, so somewhere in there. And uh, so what she does is she takes a look at the myth of the, the judgment of Paris here. Um, here it is, the judgment of Paris, which is uh, at the wedding of the parents of Achilles, actually, uh, Peleus and Thetis. Thetis is a sea nymph, kind of like Galatea. And uh, Eris has come in, and now Ellis, uh, uh, Jane Ellen Harrison has demonstrated that Eris, the word which, which means discord or strife, is related to the Aranus, the name Aranus, which are the, the Furies that dog Aristes in uh, Aeschylus's uh, Oristia. And so she's basically one of them, a demoness, who throws an apple into the wedding that says, for the fairest. And so the question becomes then, who's the fairest? Is it Hera, who is married to Zeus and represents the woman as wife? And here we have all three of them represented on this, what uh, Harrison calls a patriarchal representation of the myth. 
uh, where we've inherited it as this beauty contest. It was not originally a beauty contest at all. It's been patriarchalized. And so originally here, here we have, uh, uh, not originally, but secondarily, we have Hera admiring herself in a mirror. She represents woman as wife. Here we have Aphrodite over here with Cupid putting bracelets on her. She represents the woman as whore, the woman as a sex object, which is what she is. And then here we have um, Athena, um, and she's basically taking a bath. Um, so which of these three then is favored, is, is how the myth goes. And of course, uh, Paris then, who's just this shepherd, this nobody, um, the son of Priam and Hecuba uh, in Troy at Mount Ida. He's a farmer, a dairy farmer, basically. And for some reason, they grab him to be the judge. And of course, he chooses Aphrodite because love always cheats, of course. And so he chooses Aphrodite, the most beautiful of the three that the apple goes to. And then so, because she has promised him uh, the most beautiful woman of all time, Helen, namely, who is married to Menelaus, the brother of Agamemnon, and her sister Clytemnestra, Helen's sister Clytemnestra, uh, born from the union of Leda, the, the swan, uh, Leda with a swan, Zeus in the form of a swan. And um, so that's what has taken place here. And then Helen um, is abducted uh, while Menelaus is away visiting Crete. He's down, his maternal grandfather has died, so Crete, Cretius is his name. So he's down at the island of Crete. And then meanwhile, and this is all, keep in mind, this is set during the Mycenaean epoch with these crude primitive fortress structures that were so large that they were thought to, by the Greeks later, to have been built by the Cyclops. And so while he's away, then Paris, this lounge lizard, worthless nobody, uh, slinks in the snake that he is and makes off with her, and that starts the Trojan War, which is, is of course, pure mythology. There's not one ounce to truth of any of it. Not even truth to uh, the beauty contest itself, which, as Jane Ellen Harrison then demonstrates through her image archaeology, she goes back and she says, well, look, at some of these earlier representations on Greek vases where you have Hermes on the right here, who is the psychopomp and guide of the souls to the underworld. Then on the left, you have the three goddesses, but none of them has been distinguished or privileged in any way here. They're all represented as the same. So apparently the origins of the myth had nothing to do with a beauty contest in which one of them would be privileged over the others, which presupposes that each one of the three would be differentiated. None of these are. And then um, she looks at some other images here. And this one, I think, is the classic where this is Paris now here, represented on a vase painting on the right-hand side with his lyre. Uh, Hermes is uh, leading him toward these three women on the left. And if you look at their profiles, these aren't beautiful women at all. They're all crones. Uh, so we have the triple goddess here uh, as crones, none of them differentiated, none of them favored with a very reluctant Paris being led to them or brought into them almost by force by Hermes in the middle here. Um, so here he's being, it wasn't a beauty contest before the patriarchy inverted it. It was originally the fact that Paris was being led to his fate. The triple goddess as the Parsi um, who, who represent uh, fate, past, present, future. The structure of temporality. That's what it originally was. And then, let's see, she adduces some more evidence here. Here's another later vase painting in which the only one of the three differentiated is Athena in the middle with her headdress, but that's because the vase painter is from Athens, so naturally he's going to favor her with Hermes off on the right-hand side there. And then um, here all three of them are represented, none of them differentiated whatsoever, and with Paris, uh, or not Paris, Hermes walking on the right-hand side here, uh, with with a with a sheep um, that has nothing to do with anything, and so she thinks that originally they represented the Carides, which are the three graces actually, who bring gifts. They all bring gifts of equal value, and so none of them, uh, none of the three graces was ever favored above the other. Here's Raphael's painting, one, probably the best of all representations of the Carides, the Charities, the three graces. Each one has a gift to offer. In this case. An apple, which of course he's he want, Raphael wants you to think of the apple thrown by Eris into the wedding of Peleus and uh, Thetis. 
so that here they are, uh, Euphrosyne, uh, Talia, and Aglaia. Uh, none of them were ever differentiated, and so she thinks that the original representation actually had nothing to do with Paris. It was Hermes bringing in the three goddesses, the Charites, the Graces, offering their gifts. They were all of equal value in that sense. Okay, so this then becomes the background, uh, Jane Ellen Harrison's background for... Uh, uh, for the judgment of Paris. And so we'll go back to Peter Stein's representation here of, uh, let's see, where's the volume? Um, where is that volume? Well, it looks like I don't have the volume uh, represented. Uh, let's see here. I have to find it. Okay, so uh, kill the volume and then, okay, so this is Peter Stein's play that we're looking at here um, with uh, Act 3, the Helena before the Palace of Menelaus at Sparta, where she is here, this is Helena, and she is here with her chorus of Trojan women who have been brought with her ostensibly by Menelaus. And now this is based on, now, now what Goethe has done here is to write in German an iambic trimeter which imitates the rhythms of Greek drama. He's the first German poet to do this. But he also has in mind Euripides' play Helen, where Helen steps forth at the beginning and gives the prologos. Um, and let's read that from Helen, where Helen now sits. So in this case, and note how different the myth of Helen is with Euripides, who may have originated this. Seen as Egypt, before the royal palace, not far from the shore, on one side of the stage is a monument enshrining a stone sarcophagus at which Helen has taken sanctuary. This is the sarcophagus of Proteus, uh, whom we have just seen transformed into a dolphin in the classical Valpurgis Noct with homunculus riding on his back. So this forms an, a very perfect segue here, the allusion to Euripides' play, Helen. And Helen says, this is Egypt. Here flows the Virgin River, the lovely Nile who brings down melted snow to slake the soil of the Egyptian plain with the moisture, heaven denies. Proteus, while he lived, was king here, ruling the whole of Egypt from his palace on the island of Pharos. Now Proteus married Samathi, one of the sea nymphs, and formerly the wife of Aeacus. She bore Proteus two children, a son, Theoclamenus, a name contradicted by his impious life, and a daughter, the apple of her mother's eye, called Ido, when she was a child. When she grew up and was ripe for marriage, they called her Theonoe, for she had divine knowledge of all things present and to come. Noe from Nous, mind, Theo, meaning divine, a gift inherited from her grandfather Nereus, and we have just seen the two old men of the sea, Nereus and Proteus. Helen goes on with her prologos. But I am not an Egyptian. My home country is a place of some note, Sparta, and my father was Tyndareus, that's her supposed biological father, but of course we have the conflict of the myth of Leda and the Swan. There, she says, is there is, you know, a legend which says that Zeus took the feathered form of a swan and that being pursued by an eagle and flying for refuge to the bosom of my mother, Leda, he used this deceit to accomplish his desire upon her. That is the story of my origin, if it is true. My name is Helen. Now let me tell you of my misfortunes. The three goddesses, Hera, Aphrodite and Athena, and they represent woman as wife, woman as whore, and woman as virgin. Daughter of, Athena, daughter of Zeus, came as rivals to the glen of Mount Ida, where Paris lived, each one eager to be judged, the first in beauty, and my beauty, if so great a misfortune can be so named, was used by Aphrodite as the bride by which she won the prize, promising Paris that he would marry me. So Paris left his dairy farm on Mount Ida, and came to Sparta to win me as his bride. Sounds like a total loser, this lounge lizard. But Hera balked of her victory over the other goddesses, and her resentment, she's always pissed off, turned the substance of Aphrodite's promise into air. She gave the royal son of Priam for his bride, not me, but a living image compounded of the ether in my likeness. Paris believes that he possesses me. What he holds is nothing but an airy delusion. And so note here that... Euripides has changed the myth, and he says, well, what happened was the real Helen was secured by Hermes. 
and brought to Egypt under King Proteus's protection when he was king there, whereas a shade, an idolon, a phantom of Helen, was what Paris got and brought to Troy and what they fought the war over. It was just a phantom. And so notice that Goethe evokes this idea that even in antiquity, Helen had this idea of, of a phantom nature, uh, like Xeroxes could be made of her, which is what he has here in Act 3, the Helena, this is a shade from the underworld. It's yet another weak Xerox of Helen. She's not even real. And neither is the palace here. It's, it's, a, it's a total simulacrum. Euripides' Helen goes on, and Zeus, by his subsequent arrangements, has added to my misfortune. He brought war upon Hellas and the unhappy Phrygians, the Trojans, to ease the swarming earth of her measureless burden of men and make Achilles famous among the fighters of Greece. The Helen who went to Phrygia as a prize for Troy to defend and the Greeks to fight for, that Helen was not I, only my name. And so we'll leave that there, that you get the sense of what Goethe, as he has Helen step forth in imitation of a play by Euripides and give a prologos, a monologue, where she says in Goethe's play, Exalted much and much disparaged, Helena, I leave behind the strand where first we came ashore, still in a stupor from the, the nimble tilt and pitch of rolling seas, that brought us from the Phrygian plain. She thinks she's just been brought by Menelaus from Troy. Astride high bristling backs, thanks to Poseidon's grace and Euros' strength to inlets of the native land, King Menelaus is rejoicing down below in his return amidst the bravest of his host. But you bid welcome to me now, O lofty house, which Tyndareus, my father, back from Pallas's hill, erected for himself along the nearby slope and raised in splendor over any Spartan house, as I with sister Clytemnestra here grew up, and Clytemnestra, of course, married Agamemnon, who slew him with her lover while when he returned from Troy in his bathtub, with Castor II and Pollux, her brothers, playing happy games, be greeted then, the bronze and gates, twin portals you. It was your hospitably wide-flung openness, by which that time to me, elected out of many, shone forth bright Menelaus in a suitor's garb, now open them to me once more that I fulfill in faith a pressing royal charge as behooves a wife. Allow me entry, and let all be left behind that stormed about me hitherto so faith faithfully. For since the time I left this threshold, free of care for Cytheria's temple, mindful of sacred troth, but then a pirate seized me, the Phrygian, on that quest referring to Paris, abducting her while her husband was away in Crete, Full many things have passed, which people far and wide are fond of telling, yet which great on the ear of one of whom reports spun out have grown to a fairy tale. And, sh and then we get the response from the chorus here. You can see them, the chorus of Trojan women who have been brought with her. And now what happens is that meanwhile, uh, the, the first thing is that recall that Mephistopheles, when he met uh, the, the Forciads, that is to say the, the Greeki, who shared one eye and one tooth and transformed himself into one of them, borrowed their eye, borrowed a tooth, transformed himself into a paragon of ugliness, basically in opposition to Helen. And he will be in opposition both to Helen and the chorus of Trojan women here throughout this first part of Goethe's Helena, which note is a play within a play. Just as we saw in Faust Part One, after the romantic, the Nordic Walpurgisnacht, we had a play within a play there the, that was based on Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, the Volpurgis Night's Dream. Uh, it wasn't much of a play. It wasn't particularly good, actually. But here we have a masterpiece, another play within a play, a Euripidean play within a play. Um, and then she, she starts to wonder why Menelaus has sent her back, and now they have to perform some sort of a sacrifice because there's all this accoutrement around for a sacrifice, but yet she says, well, where's the sacrifice? There's no animals here. Where's the sacrifice? And so we think of Isaac when he's about to be sacrificed by Abraham. And he says, where's the sacrifice, Dad? Well, you're the sacrifice. And so uh, Goethe is implying, he doesn't imply, it is that uh, Menelaus now intends her to be sacrificed, which is playing then with, an, with another play, a later play by Euripides called The Trojan Women, where Menelaus says that he's going to sacrifice her when he returns. He says, uh, They that fought this weary war to get her have given her to me to kill, or if I do not choose to kill her, to have her taken back to the land of Argos. For my part, I have decided to postpone her fate while I'm in Troy, 
and to take her back on my ship to the land of Greece and then hand her over to the vengeance of those whose friends have died at Ilium. They will kill her. So in that play, he fully intends to have her sacrificed. And here, too, she begins to suspect something's up. She says, um, all these things... uh, uh, then there ensued the master's further imperious word, the master being Menelaus. Once you are done surveying all in order do, then take as many tripods as you deem of need, and sundry vessels, such as one at sacrifice, wants close at hand as he performs the sacred rite, the cauldrons and the bowls, the shallow saver too, set purest water from the holy fountain by, in its tall pitchers and the well-dried kindling too, swift to accept the flame, keep there in readiness." A well-honed knife should not be lacking for the last. All the remainder, though, I leave unto your care. Thus spoke he, she says, urging my departure. But no thing that draws life's breath did he in his ordaining mark for slaughter, worshipful of the Olympian gods. This gives me pause. Yet I, dismissing undue care, committed all unto the hands of gods on high, who bring to pass what they may harbor in their thought, and whether it by human minds be judged benign, or else of evil, we the mortals suffer it. So she's sort of resigned to her fate, but she suspects something's up. And something is indeed up. And so what happens is that um, she goes inside the palace uh, and finds that it's completely abandoned. No one's in there. No serving, no ladies in, in waiting, no serving maids, no stewardesses. What the hell is going on? Of course, because they're all dead. And this is a sim- simulacrum. It's not even the real palace except that she finds Mephistopheles in there in his guise now as an old woman uh, the uh, Forsias um, except that Forsias interestingly the mother of the three Greek or the father of the three Greek was male and uh, married Ceto the whale goddess to produce the Greek the sirens Scylla from Scylla and Carb- Carbus um, but yet Goethe here has him change sexes to an old crone in order to evoke the myth of Tiresias. Tiresias is the one who was bl- uh, made, he was blind, and uh, Zeus and Hera got into a fight about who enjoys sex more, the man or the woman. And um, Zeus said, women do. Hera said, men do. Let's ask Tiresias. And Tiresias says, no, women enjoy it more. There's no doubt about that. Of course, because they can have multiple orgasms. So naturally, that, that would be the natural answer because he had experienced sex for seven years as a woman when he was wandering with his staff, saw two snakes copulating, touched them, and was transformed from a man into a woman. Seven years of of life as a woman later, he finds the same two serpents, touches them with the staff, and he's transformed back into a man. So Goethe wants you to think of that. Mephisto has changed sexes as an old woman, uh, an ugly old woman. And she says, uh, Helena says, What I have seen, you shall lay eyes upon yourselves, addressing the chorus, unless it be that ancient night at once engulfed her form back in her womb's portentous depth, but I will put it into words so you may know. When mindful of the task at hand, I gravely stepped into the somber mid-space of the royal house. The hush of vacant passageways astonished me. And Forcius, Mephisto is Forcius, as an old uh, stewardess, is the only person in there that she sees. And then as she comes back out, uh, and here she's addressing the chorus. Mephisto, as Forcius, then also comes back out, and he uh, engages in a debate, representing the principle of ugliness against all these beautiful maidens, and of course Helen is the most beautiful woman, and goes back and forth. He accuses them of being whores. He accuses them. He says, uh, modesty and beauty never go hand in hand. Beautiful women, are, there's nothing chaste about them, and they seduce men and are easily seduced. They're whores, is basically what he says when he comes out. They go back and forth. They all say, oh, she's an ugly old crone. Too bad for her. She can't get laid. We can. And so it goes back and forth, back and forth. And slowly what happens is that Helen becomes completely confused as to who or what she is. Goethe's such a master here. The, The dude's incredible. She doesn't know if she's real or not. And she starts to become confused and she starts confusing her memories with being brought back by Menelaus from the Trojan War. And she confuses it with coming up out of the underworld that she has just been brought up out of. And the dawning, horrific realization starts dawning on her that she's just a myth. 
an eidolon, as Goethe calls her, which is a Greek word for a phantom. That's what she realizes that she is. Here, she, I think in this scene, she's just about to realize it, and then she swoons and faints, and the chorus catches her. And they're like, what? This None of this is real? We're, this is just a... It's a stage play with Forcius Mephisto in the role of a stage manager. He's directing the play here, which links us back to the opening in the theater, of course, with the stage manager and the poet. And here he is. He's, he's just coming out of the house as the crone, Forcius. Um, so he's coming out, and then they're about to engage in their uh, stichomythia, their back-and-forth rapid-fire exchange of insults between ugliness and beauty. Um, and then slowly what happens is that Forcius says, guess what? You know who the sacrifice is? All of you. You're all going to be sacrificed, just like, and there's a reference to the Odyssey, when Odysseus returns, slays all the suitors, and then he has all the serving girls killed too, along with the suitors. Um, that's what's going to happen to all of you, including Helen. So get ready. Here's the axe. And this, of course, uh, Forcius, Mephisto Forcius, suggesting that uh, Helen's going to be beheaded, links us back to Gretchen's beheading. So this is another tragedy all over again. This is just such a masterpiece. I'm sorry. It just goes on and on. And then so what happens is that he says, um, well, listen, uh, Menelaus is on his way with his men. And then he has some stage managed special effects in the background of the sound of horns. And the terrified chorus of Trojan women thinks that they're about to be sacrificed by Menelaus on his way back. Um, but really, it's, it's just a stage play. And he starts describing castles to the north that were set up by feudal lords in the Middle Ages. And so now Goethe starts to shift us back to the Gothic Nordic land that we started with, that Faust and Mephisto come from, where they belong. And he's going to then bring uh, the Trojan women plus Helen to a castle of feudal lords, a Gothic castle, where the feudal lord actually will turn out to be Faust. And so he starts, to, as the scene ends, he starts describing Faust. Oh, he's just, you'll like this guy, uh, Forcius says. Uh, Helena says, so how are his looks? And Forcius, and remember that Faust is 30 years younger, so he's about 20. And Forcius says, not bad. I like him well. He's high-spirited, bold-tempered, nobly made, judicious too, like few among the Greeks. They call his kind barbarians, yet I suspect their likes might not be cruel as besieging Troy, more than one hero ravened like a cannibal. I know his breadth of soul. To him I'd trust myself. And there's his castle, too. You should lay eyes on that. Far different, indeed, from clumsy mounds of stone, referring to the Mycenaean fortresses that do indeed look clumsy and were primitive. The Mycenaeans looked up to the Minoans as the master architects, such as your father's helter-skelter jumbled up, like Cyclops, walls cyclo Cyclopean, crashing down raw stone on stone unhewn. There, on the other hand, in the north, all's perpendicular and level by the rule, the Gothic style of architecture, which is very linear by comparison. Look at it from the outside. Heavenward it sweeps, so rigid, truly jointed, mirror smooth as steel. To try to scale it, why, the very thought slides off. Within, the spaciousness of courtyards wide, enclosed by edifice galore of every kind and end, there's columns large and small, vaults, arches, arculets, arcades and galleries for looking out and in, escutcheons too. And so he describes uh, all this medieval architecture of this castle that he's about to take them to, where Faust is the liege lord, uh, the medieval lord. And um, the chorus is all, okay, let's do it. Yeah, let's get out of here. Or it's better that than be sacrificed as offerings by Menelaus and his men who are on the way back. And so the scene concludes, and we'll end it here. Uh, with the chorus saying, uh, Oh, how gladly speed we thither, hurrying footsteps, death at our backs, before us once more, a looming stronghold's impregnable bastion. May it shelter as well as Ilion's citadel did, which succumbed at length, but to treacherous stratagem. Fog spreads about, shrouding the background and the foreground as well at will. So the whole classical world here disintegrates, and Goethe pays farewell to it for the final time. And they say, what? What is this? Sisters, look about. Was it not smiling day? Mists arise in wavering streaks from Eurota's sacred flood. 
Lost to sight already the lovely reed and garland and bank. No more, alas, do I see the soft on-glide of the swans, allies in floating joy, free in its pride and grace. Yet, after all, I hear their call, their far-off husky note, death-heralding note, they say. And so they hear the swans of the north uh, singing their swan songs. And, of course, Helen is the offspring of a swan, Leda and the swan. Ah, would that when all is done it may not have augured us to ruin and promised rescue stead to us who are swan-like, long, fair, and white of neck, nor, oh, to her, are swan-begotten, woe to us, woe. And then they say, all is covered by now, shrouded in mist all round. Are we not losing sight of each other? What is it? They, they disintegrate like a dream upon waking. Uh, are we walking or merely floating trippingly over the hidden ground? Can you see... Is it not perchance Hermes floating ahead? Not his golden staff flashing, bidding us back again to ill-favored gray dawning Hades, full of impalpable figments, overthronged, eternally void. And so, Goethe returns us back at the end of this scene, full circle to Hermes, in the judgment of Paris, leading the goddesses forward. And in some versions and in others, leading uh, Paris to, to them, to his fate. So we come full circle as Hermes surfaces to lead them to the underworld. But it's not the underworld. They're going to the Gothic North, uh, which will be the next scene in her courtyard of a, of a castle. We'll look at that next.